The internet has changed the way we live. It has changed the way we work, the way we shop, and even the way we date. It has also changed the way we kill. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm on a quest to explore the dark side of our online world, where one click can lead to murder. The internet and social media has been a godsend to online predators. Why? Because of the speed in which they can, one, create fake profiles, but two, access victims. I'll be investigating some of the most disturbing crimes in recent history, where the internet and social media have been used to trick, torture and kill innocent victims lured into a virtual world where nothing is as it seems. Clearly, she did not realise the person she was talking to online was the man who was going to kill her. In this programme, the murder of Hayley Jones by her partner, Brian Lewis. The couple first met when he was 18 years old and she was just 13. Despite the age difference, they settled down and had four children. But as Hayley grew up, the couple grew apart. She started to spend long hours on Facebook. But Lewis was convinced she was talking to other men online. And he snapped. Was Brian Lewis unable to cope as Haley became more mature and independent? Did he find this loss of control unbearable? And as Haley escaped into the world of social media, did this fuel Lewis's paranoia to the point where murder became inevitable? Social media is a global phenomenon. Nearly a third of the planet's population, that's 2.3 billion, regularly use it. But there's a downside. Serious relationship problems can be caused by the use of social networks. And 25% of us admit to taking a sneaky peek at our loved ones' online postings. And sometimes we don't like what we find. When Brian Lewis spied on his partner Haley's Facebook account, he became so incensed, he decided to kill her. After 13 years together, Haley changed her relationship status to single. I'm not going to let this happen. Incensed, Lewis told friends that if he couldn't have her, then no one could. A few nights later, his resentment erupted into an orgy of violence. He stabbed Haley, and when that attack failed to kill her, he placed his hands around her neck and strangled her to death. I'm on my way to New Tredegar in South Wales, where 26-year-old Haley Jones lived and where she died. And I want to find out if her use of social media was merely a harmless pastime misconstrued by her jealous husband or whether there was something much deeper at play. Did her use of Facebook reflect a desperation to escape her everyday existence and did that desperation lead to her murder? New Tredegar is a small town nestling high in the Welsh Valleys. The bulk of the area's heavy industries, the ironworks and mines are long gone, but the communities that man them remain. Industrial decline brought with it big social changes for people here. In 2009, this is where Haley lived with Brian Lewis and their four children. Haley was just 13 when she met 18-year-old Brian Lewis here at a local fun fair. 
the travelling fair came just once a year. And it was a real opportunity for young people to get together and to let their hair down. It appears that Haley and Lewis were instantly attracted to each other and their relationship developed very quickly. Relatives reported that she was completely smitten with her new boyfriend. For experts, the five-year age gap between the 13-year-old Haley and 18-year-old Brian Lewis is of concern. They would have had completely different mindsets at that time. And we need to remember 13-year-old girls are immature. And that first relationship is going to be incredibly important, especially if it fits that romantic ideal. They've got nothing to measure it against. And quite often, when older men choose younger girls, it's because they find them easier to control. As teenage relationships go, this was a pretty serious one. Lewis and Haley saw each other pretty much every day. And when Lewis got kicked out of his home after a family row, Haley's mom, Sally, invited him to move in and to live with her 13-year-old daughter. The fact that Haley's mother accepted this would have put a sanction on Lewis in that he thinks, well, that's it, it's fine, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it if her mother agrees. Outsiders might be surprised by the big age gap between Haley and Lewis. Local journalist Wayne Novacek has worked here for over 40 years and knows the area and its people well. How do you think the community would have viewed a relationship between an 18-year-old man and a 13-year-old girl? This relationship wasn't particularly unusual in the Welsh Valleys or, in fact, in any economically challenged city. They would have been concerned, yes, they would have kept a weather eye on the couple. They would not necessarily have decried the couple if it was clear to them that it was a loving relationship. They would allow it room to nurture and grow rather than condemn it. These are not communities where both the, the man's family and the woman's family would refrain from interfering. These are strong, proud communities who look after their own. In 1999, just three years after they met, Haley gave birth to their first child at just 16 years of age. This was to mark a key shift in her life. She was now a full-time mother, while most of her other friends were still at school. She was a child when he met her. She was a child when she first got pregnant. She was a child when she became a mother. And that was all she ever knew, childhood and him. Lewis had got a job on the railways and earned enough for them to afford a mortgage on their own house just two streets away from Haley's family. Over the next few years, the couple had more children. And by the time she reached her early 20s, Haley was a mother of four. Lewis had her exactly where he wanted her. Four children in quick succession, such a young person. It's not unusual for people who are very controlling to keep their girlfriends pregnant because it makes them more vulnerable and it makes them more dependent. Lewis is not a complex character. He likes to be able to go to work. He has his young wife at home. And I think he probably thinks that's where she belongs. I'm the provider. I'm the man, and you're at home looking after the children. She's trapped. Then in 2007, 10 years after the couple had got together, the family's whole world was thrown into turmoil. The breakdown of their relationship, I would suggest, could be traced from 18 months prior to the incident itself. Brian lost his job, and like a lot of people with a partner and children, may have felt a bit impotent in terms of what he might provide to the family. He wasn't in a position to provide as he once did. Lewis losing his job at age 29 was a disaster for the family. Like many men in the area, he then struggled to find other full-time employment. Their lives are certainly becoming a mess now. Four children, he's not working, there's control in the relationship. At this point now, it, it's heading nowhere good. It fell to Haley to become the breadwinner, to pay the mortgage and to look after their growing brood. She took a job as a care worker at this nursing home where her mother also worked. And coming up to Christmas, she was working gruelling 12-hour shifts. Meanwhile, Lewis was staying at home 
are drinking in local establishments. She had new friends, a new career. He was at home brooding. Lewis's life was shrinking just when hers was expanding. As his prestige within that family unit was being eroded, his self-esteem will have been near the floor. Haley's wage was never going to be enough to support their large family, and their debts mounted. Stuck at home while Haley worked, Lewis became increasingly frustrated. For a man who liked to be in control of every aspect of his partner's life, the situation was becoming intolerable. It was around this time when Lewis started to psychologically bully Haley. He called her names, told her she was worthless and that no one else would want her. Worse still, he tried to turn the children against her. This is now legally recognised as a form of domestic abuse. When you're a victim and you're on that journey, it's really hard to recognise it. And it's a drip, 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 drip effect. It is like a frog in cold water that doesn't realise when the temperature's being turned up and it slowly cooks and boils. In my eyes, she was a lamb to the slaughter. It seems Lewis couldn't handle the fact that Haley had grown from the child he first met into an independent young woman and the breadwinner in their household. I've come to London to discuss this aspect of the case in greater detail with psychologist Mike Berry and criminologist Dr. Elizabeth Yardley. What's going on here is what I'd refer to as role strain. So he's used to being the breadwinner, he's used to being the alpha male, the one that's in charge. But now, Haley is emerging as a, an independent and a vibrant young woman. She's been a wife, she's been a mother, but now she's gone out into the workplace. She's a friend, she's a colleague. Middle class men often choose to stay at home with family and become a house husband and everything else. They have control over that decision. He lost his job, all the control was taken out. And we've got a man here who loves control. So for him to lose that, that sole kind of pillar of power, that's really significant for him. But it's only part of the underlying problems in their lives. And we know that she was pregnant and had a child by 16, so we know they were having sex before. That is a, is a warning sign, to say the least. Can I just call it what it is? It's criminal. We can't really be surprised that it ends up so tragically when it started out so criminally. Well, you've got to look at it in context. I mean, what are the relationships like in the community? Because we've got the legal code, which very clearly says this is an illegal relationship. And then you've got the, the social norms and the values of a particular community, which condones this type of relationship. So when you've got behavior going on in a community where everybody is doing it, it, it doesn't stand out to you as odd or, or bizarre. It's just the way things are. With the relationship under increasing strain, Haley joined Facebook. She initially used it to keep in touch with her friends and family. But as she started to spend more and more time online, Lewis began to suspect that she was using it for less innocent purposes. Lewis is a very insecure individual who every time he hears the tapping of keys by Haley, feels that that is Haley talking to another man. Every time he hears a tap of the keys, it's going through his heart. This will just make him resent her more, make him jealous. That makes him even more and more angry that eventually he's going to burst. I'm in New Tredegar in South Wales, where Hayley Jones met her partner, Brian Lewis, when he was 18 and she was just 13. The couple had four children, but their relationship hit the rocks when he lost his job. Haley took to Facebook as an escape, but Lewis grew angry about the time she spent online. He became increasingly insecure that he was losing control of her as she forged a new independence and developed new friendships. Lewis's frustration mounted until he eventually snapped with fatal consequences. I've come to the Welsh Valleys in the hope that I can discover more about this tragic story. Background reading of the case notes has given me an insight into the predicament Haley found herself in at the end of 2008. 
The investigation notes clearly indicate that at this stage, Haley was trapped in a relationship with an increasingly unpredictable and violent partner. Lewis began to drink heavily and this exacerbated his underlying anger and frustration. What began as verbal abuse then escalated. To me, this is clearly the signs of a man beginning to unravel. Lewis had lost control of the relationship, he'd lost control of his finances, and he'd lost control of the household. She was no longer this little child that he was able to control and manipulate. Suddenly, she was a woman who was experiencing things for herself and probably realising, actually, I don't want to be with him. Haley was trapped in a vicious circle. The more angry Lewis became, the more unhappy Haley became, and the more she retreated into her online world. The amount of time she was spending on Facebook grew. He told detectives that she was coming home from work at 8 in the morning after a 12-hour shift and spending several hours on there before going to bed. And she was also spending her spare time in the evening on Facebook as well. And he said it was interfering with their family life. I don't think she necessarily had an adolescence away from him. She was with him from an early age. By going on to social media as she did, she probably began to realise the things that she'd missed out on. So it's no longer just him and her in this world. It's him, her, Facebook, her friends, the outer world that he's been able to keep her from for all these years. Why did Haley spend so much time online? She must have been aware it was making her partner angry. So is it possible that she was actually becoming addicted to social media? Internet addiction is really defined by the amount of disruption to somebody's life. They would prefer to be on the net perhaps even the expense of their social relationships. If the non-user happens to be very jealous or insecure, that can provoke a rather dangerous situation. It releases dopamine in the brain, so it's very addictive for somebody. If you don't live an exciting life, Facebook becomes a world where you can live a different life. Whether Haley was addicted to Facebook or was simply using it to escape her very difficult domestic circumstances still is not clear. What is certain, however, is that Lewis's increasing resentment towards the amount of time she was spending online was reaching boiling point. He now clearly believes she was communicating with a man and having an affair behind his back. There's never any evidence that she was developing a love interest elsewhere. The fact that she was spending so long on the internet suggests that she was certainly losing interest in him. Something's got to give. Lewis was ready to explode. He suspects everything. He suspects that she's possibly sleeping with other men, not just talking to them. He's looking for evidence. Haley's obsessive internet use, wittingly or unwittingly, only served to add fuel onto her partner's paranoia. He told his friends that every time when he came into the room, she quickly closed down the laptop, which suggested to him that she was talking about him online. And she was. Around the end of 2008, Haley began to imagine life without Lewis, discussing it online with her friends. Maybe she was blind to the anger her use of social media was causing her partner. Or maybe she was just past caring. But for a man who craved control, Haley's online life was too much to bear. Usually when you've got an anxious or jealous or insecure partner, it can force the other one to be a little bit more secretive, furtive, especially if that non-user is somewhat domineering. That can be hideously misinterpreted and lead to an escalation of conflict between two individuals. Haley was double-clicking. Double-click is something where your partner comes into the room that you either go onto another screen or shut the laptop. That is going to start to send him really, really paranoid. Paranoid anyway because his wife's never done this before, but paranoid because he's also got too much time on his hands, he's not working, and he's going to start ruminating about what's going on. Lewis was a man losing control in every sense. And at the end of February 2009, he turned his anger onto one of his kids, leaving the child bruised and shaken. For yourself to be abused, that's fine. But 
from my personal experience, you stay because you're safeguarding the children. So it's safer to stay with an abuser than it is to leave. That would have been her moment where she thought, this is it, I've, I've got to get out now. I think at that point she probably realised that this man was not dealing with the challenges of life very well at all. It was a turning point for Hayley. In early March 2009, she decided it was time to split with Lewis for good. But the way she announced it was befitting of her obsession with social media. About 10 days before her murder, she changed her status to single on Facebook. She clearly thought that Lewis was a lot stricter than he needed to be. It feels like such a benign thing to do. She couldn't possibly have known the impact that that would have had. She would have sparked his worst fear. The control is to make sure that the partner cannot, does not leave. As soon as the partner says, I'm leaving, you poked a stick into the hornet's nest. Lewis was incensed to discover that Haley had announced their separation in such a public fashion. Now she's showing everybody it's over. So it's the separation risk factor, plus the public humiliation, plus the fact that he no, now knows there is no way back. Haley changed her relationship status on March 2nd, but she's tried to continue as normal as possible for the sake of the kids. A few days later, the couple went out with friends to the local social club in their village of New Tredegar. The couple bickered and left early. Who is he? The heated argument then continued in the car. Because I know! And friends witnessed Lewis slapping Haley. This was becoming more and more a serious conflict situation. At this point, alarm bells should have gone off. This is not going in a good direction. She's being physically abused by him. I think it was always in him. I think he was in the abuser end of. The long hours Haley spent on social media are clearly hugely significant. But why was Lewis's response so violent? I'm going to address this with my colleagues, Dr. Liz Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry. I suspect he's anxious that she's going to hook up with somebody else, but also it's the secrecy, it makes him paranoid, envy starts to creep in and it just grows and grows into explosion. Was Haley's use of Facebook normal or was it an addiction? What she's doing here, she's exercising her right to privacy which she has, you know, she has the right to have her own Facebook account to make connections with, with people outside of the home. So I think that the fact that it, it's quite different from what's come before, we might think, oh, this is an addiction, this is problematic. It's not. The, the person who's problematic here is Lewis, it's not Hayley. Disagree with you. I think it is addiction. All her life is work and the internet. Surely she's entitled to a few hours a day. She's working 12 hours a day, plus traveling, and then looking after the kids. Three to four hours in that short time is a lot of time. It's excessive, it's addictive. This is an incredibly oppressed woman, and here she has an opportunity to escape from that. There's a journey she's going on here, Mike, isn't there, Liz? She's expressing herself, she's gonna find herself a group, new group of friends, and then she's going to leave him. What she's found in social media, in Facebook, is something that's hers, something that's hers alone. I mean, a lot of the, the things in her life she's, she's had to share with Lewis and, and share with the children, and it's never been very much about her. And it's, I think it's, it's something that she thinks, yeah, this is mine, this is exciting, and I'm gonna keep it for myself. I mean, what a role social media plays here. An opportunity for a woman domestically abused, now exercising her independence to say, I'm single. I think that's frightening, actually, for him. She does it behind his back. That adds to his paranoia. He's already paranoid that she's having affairs on the side. Now he's suddenly dumped, and he's dumped spectacularly on a Facebook. His mates down the pub will read this on Facebook to be told by your friend, oh, by the way, Hayley's single on Facebook now. That would be really humiliating for him. The real core of this for me is Hayley discovering her independence. That's the thing that, that sets Lewis off. And social media here, it, it hasn't sparked the flame, but it has added a little bit of fuel to the fire. Hayley changing her Facebook status was the final straw for Lewis. The countdown to her murder had begun. 
I'm in New Tredegar in South Wales, where in March 2009, Hayley Jones lived with her unemployed partner, Brian Lewis, and their four children. Lewis couldn't cope when he discovered that she had changed her Facebook status from married to single. It was to prove the catalyst for a brutal murder. A few days after she changed her status, Lewis had been seen hitting Haley in public. He was now openly abusing her. Their relationship had broken down completely. Lewis, at this stage, is still quite immature. He doesn't know what to do. His whole life has been turned upside down. Lewis's behaviour now provided several worrying aspects of what criminologists call the homicide triad. The homicide triad is a mechanism by which we can look at the risk markers, the danger signs, if you like, that happen before a homicide. So we split it into three areas, the psychology of the offender, the high-risk markers that might be present, and the triggers that actually push that homicide to happen. The psychology is that of somebody who presents danger to Haley. When he starts losing control, high-risk markers start coming in. So we have two parts of the triad now. So at this point, we are actually in a danger zone. After the row in the car, Lewis went to stay with his family in nearby Fokru. This gave Haley valuable breathing space to think about the future. By the time he'd returned, she'd made up her mind that either he needed to go or she would leave with the kids. She couldn't possibly have known that separation is the biggest trigger for things to escalate really dangerously. On the morning of March 10th, Haley returned home after a 12-hour night shift. Finding Lewis in the house, she went straight to the bedroom. Furious that she'd blanked him, Lewis followed Haley upstairs. He comes in, he sees Haley yet again on the computer, and we know he has struck her. And of course, if the relationship has broken down to such an extent, and now he is bursting, it can only mean one thing, that there's going to be violence. All of Lewis's frustration and rage spilled out. He dragged Haley out of bed by her hair. He also turned his anger on her laptop, the thing that had come between him and his family. In this relationship, there were three people. Lewis, there was Haley, and Facebook. That laptop signified a physical human being to Lewis. He felt his partner was actually having an affair every single time she opened that lid of that laptop there's violence and suddenly there's damage, that is strong, strong indication that there is now a trigger. And that is something that's really dangerous because we have now completed the triad. It was obvious to Haley that she must act. She told Lewis to move out while she looked for somewhere to rent for her and the children. To underline the separation, the couple now also slept apart with Haley sleeping on the sofa in the front room. On March 11th, Lewis headed down to the social club to drown his sorrows. As well as his problems with Haley, money worries were also playing on his mind. He didn't think he could afford the mortgage if Haley left him. And he thought he'd be sent to prison because he couldn't afford to pay his debts. He was witnessed by persons in the local working men's club being fairly morose. And he saying, look, the, the relationship is at an end, but he didn't want it to be at an end. Lewis's drinking companions were used to his complaints. Just two days before, he'd been overheard saying, if I can't have her, nobody will, because I'll kill her first. Tragically, no one seems to have taken his threat on Haley's life seriously. The moment you decide that you go in, that is the most dangerous. If people would have known how desperate she was and what an abuser he was, and then somebody overhearing that in the pub, you know, him saying that, then they probably would have thought, oh my goodness, you know, he probably really does mean this because we know that Haley's in an abusive relationship. You know, perhaps we better make that call. I will never let you go. 
perhaps something that anybody might say, but it isn't. It's quite a specific mindset, and it's that mindset that we see in most of our homicide perpetrators. Rather ominously, Lewis said that Haley was in for a big surprise the next morning. Haley, by this stage, was in trouble. Lewis is going to burst. He is going to want to actually hurt her because he resents her so much. After she put the children to bed, Haley started chatting to friends and family on Facebook. When word reached her about what Lewis had been saying in the club, she took it to mean that he was finally going to leave, and no doubt she felt relieved. It's been shown in research globally these murders are always planned. When he said, I've got a surprise for her in the morning, that surprise was probably her death. Lewis arrived home drunk and went straight upstairs without speaking to Haley. Haley messaged a friend to say he's in and is being a bit difficult. Shortly afterwards, she messaged a friend to say he's starting again. The night of the incident, he came home and effectively had been told that in the following morning he would be leaving the address. In the early hours of March the 12th, she was sleeping downstairs on a settee inside a sleeping bag, which itself was inside a second sleeping bag, and she was clothed, and that became really important during the trial that followed. Haley had left the television on and it kept Lewis awake. Close to breaking point, he thundered downstairs to where she was sleeping and started a row, which lasted several minutes and which woke their five-year-old child. Yes. I will leave you alone and chat with your friends. You know what? My friends. Lewis then headed to the kitchen where he took a knife out of one of the drawers. The murder had an element of planning because he went to get the knife but to do it with no consideration that his children could be hearing what happened is so horrific. He has gone beyond rationality. It is now simply a situation where it is his control and esteem versus her existence. Brian Lewis had murder in mind. He stabbed the defenseless Haley. But the blade was deflected without hitting any vital organs. The pathology report suggested that the only reason it didn't go much further in was because the knife actually was stopped on one of her ribs. In his own account, having stabbed her, she looked up to him, said things along the lines of, we've got children together, why are you doing this? looking it through Haley's eyes and what may be her last moment, saying to him, I love you, as he was killing her, I can totally relate to that. Because you're trying to make him come out of that moment of madness. Lewis didn't stop there. As she lay wounded, he placed his hands around her neck and then strangled Haley to death. By his own admission, he's put his hands around her throat and he's pressing so hard that he found it difficult to release her throat. This was a truly merciless slaying. I'd like to hear from my colleagues, criminologist Dr. Liz Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry about what they can deduce from the events leading up to this tragic murder. There are some really, really important red flags here that aren't just about the violence. So this is the threat of separation. Haley said, that's it, enough, this, this relationship is over. Verbal threats to, to kill her that he's expressed to, to people that he knows in the community. And those are some really, really important warning signs for an intimate partner homicide like this. So it's not just about the violence. She wrote her own death warrant when she changed her status. But what we're doing when we're, we're putting the, the onus on the victim is we're victim blaming. We're saying that they are responsible for their own victimization. It's, it's Lewis's interpretation. It's his lack of behavioral control that has led to Haley's death. Now, this was red rag to a bull, Mike. 
Yes, the bells are there, they're ringing. We can see the signs, but maybe we're being unfair. Maybe because of our expertise, we know this, we've had a history of seeing this in so many clients, patients, criminals, and maybe the ordinary person doesn't always see it. But the other problem when you're in this situation is you do become blind. You become so enclosed in the world that you're trying to survive in that you don't have the, the vision to see outside of it, and that's, maybe that's part of the problem. And what we need to be really clear about here is that Lewis didn't just snap. This did not come out of the blue. This was a man who's got a history of violence, and I think he'd been escalating towards this for quite some time. And we've also got to consider the use of alcohol. If he's been down the pub, he's angry, he's disinhibitioned, he's likely to become more and more dangerous. Was this a premeditated murder or a spur of the moment triggered by the events that night or by the change of status? That transition from trying to kill her by one method to another, I mean, that there is an opportunity there for him to have decided, I'm not going to go through with this, I'm not going to kill her. So it, I think it does tell us something, that he's deciding to do this. Not decided, he's determined. Most men, if they've done some violence, they will get that point and they go, oh my gosh, what have I done, and stop. But no, he is determined to go on and he starts to strangle her. That's the most personal way to kill somebody because you're looking in the face, you're seeing what you're actually doing, you're getting feedback, and that's total control. Brian Lewis was furious at the disintegration of his relationship. He even suspected that his partner and the mother of his four children, Haley, had been seeing other men. When she changed her relationship status to single on Facebook, he made up his mind to kill her. In the early hours of March 12, 2009, he stabbed Haley and then strangled her to death. Lewis thought that all four children were asleep as he murdered Haley, but he was wrong. His five-year-old son had been woken by the row and heard all the tragic events as they unfolded. From upstairs, the child clearly heard his mother cry out to Lewis, no, no, I love you. I can totally relate to that. My perpetrator, he had that glazed look over his, over his eyes. You know, you're trying to make him sort of snap out of, of that moment of madness, and Haley would have been doing exactly the same thing. Lewis had carried out his chilling threat. If he couldn't have Haley, nobody would. After the struggle ended, the child overheard his father calling the police and confessing that he'd killed his girlfriend. Quite often, when these homicides happen, the perpetrator will go to the police. They might even phone from the crime scene. It's almost that they feel that they've managed to control the situation, and they say themselves, I felt relieved as soon as she was dead. Lewis fled the scene. Nobody but him knows what was going through his mind as he drove through the blackness of that night. But some time later, he arrived at Blackwood Police Station, five miles from the family home, where he handed himself in. Back at the house, the children made a horrific discovery. To leave his four children with his dead wife's body is so inexcusable and so hard to understand how any parent could do that. It shows the mindset of the man, of how single-minded he was about this. Nobody else mattered at all. What mattered was he gained control of the situation by killing her. Around 4 a.m., the children raced to their grandmother, screaming, looking for help. They said, Mammy's on the floor, she's bleeding, she's dead. Paramedics raced to the scene. They tried to put a tube into Haley's airway, but her windpipe had been crushed. The paramedics tried to resuscitate Haley. They had difficulty in actually putting a tube down the throat of Haley because of the because of the crushed throat. Lewis said that he was pressing so hard that he hurt his thumbs. He found it difficult to release her throat. Lewis was charged with Haley's murder, but this wasn't going to be a straightforward case for the authorities. Despite Lewis having confessed to the crime, he then pleaded not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility. The police would now have to prove not only that he murdered Haley, but also 
that he knew exactly what he was doing. Scenes of crime analysis would now be crucial in proving that Lewis intended to kill Haley. The defendant said that it all happened accidentally. Scenes of crime's job was to find evidence to refute this. We were looking for the force that had been used to stab the deceased and also the force that had been used to strangle her. The deceased was lying down and still in the sleeping bag. It would indicate that there wasn't a physical argument. The stab injury had gone through the sleeping bag and through clothing. This couldn't have been an accident because the force that was applied was so significant. The strangulation will show that it wasn't done in a fit of rage, that it was actually a continuation of an attack following the stabbing. The post-mortem found that the deceased windpipe had been crushed. There was no doubt in the pathologist's mind and the scene's crime mind that this was murder. The police also carried out a forensic investigation of Haley's computer. That analysis proved that she had never used it to communicate with another man. Lewis's suspicions about her messaging love rivals behind his back had been totally unfounded. When Brian Lewis's trial started in Cardiff Crown Court, he still denied having murdered Haley. He said that he fully accepted the end of the relationship but that Haley was killed accidentally during a row between the pair. He claimed she was standing up when she was first injured and that he only had a knife in his hand to cut his nails. During the court proceedings, in his version of events, Haley came at him during an argument. He was trimming his nails with a large kitchen knife, which is plainly absurd, and forensic evidence showed that that blow could only have been inflicted when she was lying down and therefore not on her feet. That prevented Lewis from arguing in court that the eventual strangulation of Haley had been a one-off loss of control, because by then he'd already tried to kill her with a knife. A moment which really undermined the defence case. When he was being cross-examined, he broke down in court, talking about some of the threats that he'd made. I was only making them in drink, and then he suddenly seemed to realise perhaps I wasn't just making them in, in, in drink, and that perhaps I did mean them because after what I did to Haley, you know, I might have been capable of doing that. Understandably, the jury didn't buy his version of events and they returned a guilty verdict within hours. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 14 years to serve. When the verdict came in, he was emotionless. He, there was no reaction from him whatsoever. It was quite, quite chilling, really. Criminologists categorise murder cases to try to prevent similar tragedies happening in the future. So what type of murderer do crime expert Dr Elizabeth Yardley and forensic psychologist Mike Berry think Brian Lewis was? How do you place this in terms of online and Facebook murder? Well, as criminologists, we've been studying homicide, we've been looking at murder and manslaughter for years and years and years, but now we've got something different to contend with. We've got social media, we've got the internet. So in terms of this case, I'd say that Lewis was very much a, a reactor. So this is somebody who, who sees something that their victim has posted on Facebook and, and reacts to that in a completely disproportionate way by attacking them face to face. This is a murder that could have been prevented. I think so, but I think we, we don't need to be looking at social media for the answers here. We need to be looking at the wider values that we have. Him saying, you know, she's not going to be with anybody else and I'll kill her before she does that. Wow, you know, what, what a red flag that is. And it's this kind of closing the curtains and what goes on behind closed doors is, is their business. Actually, it's not. And it's this interpretive denial that goes on in all communities when we see clear evidence of abuse, but we interpret that in a way that justifies not acting on it. Was there something that should have been done or could have been done differently that would have saved Haley's life? Yes, I think her being on the internet three or four hours a night, this addiction that she had, the putting down the, the screen as soon as he came in adds to his paranoia. I think what people have to do is be much more open about their use of the internet. As he was killing her, she was crying out, no, Brian, I love you, and her children, their children, were upstairs. The fact that the children are in the house is, is really, really concerning to me, because that suggests he doesn't give a damn, actually. He doesn't care about them, he cares about him. And, and we've seen so many cases like this where we have a kind of self-righteous family annihilator who says, this is my family, 
I'm in control, I decide what happens, and it's their role as a father and as a husband or partner that is central to them. There, but for the grace of God, those children are still alive. We've seen it in other cases, and we just can be thankful that there was only one murder victim that day when there could have been five. Yeah. This is a case which clearly highlights the perils of social media. Social media is like a dark mirror. Whatever you bring to it, it will reflect back to you. If you're depressed, you tend to get more depressed. If you're isolated and you spend a lot of time through social media, you will become more isolated and lonely. Whatever you have, it will reflect back to you and it will get worse. This was a murder with many victims. Haley died at the hands of the man she once loved, and their children lost both parents that night. It's tragic, given the four children who were orphaned by this. The use of social media, it opened her eyes to the fact that, look, there's more to life than being sat behind a closed door in your own home. And the ultimatum for the end of the relationship came about, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. He put his talons into Haley but she grew out of them. He actually killed the one thing that was of significance in his life. Brian Lewis was a weak bully who committed a senseless crime while clinging to his fragile self-worth. Until this country takes the blinkers off and looks at domestic violence in the light that it should be looked into, Haley is not gonna be the first and she's not gonna be the last.